we're resuming. I know it's been a couple weeks with Easter intervening and so forth. We're talking about our identity on being kings and priests unto God. And I think it's been wonderful that Pastor Tom has been speaking on uh, Hebrews for the Gentiles because a lot of the book of Hebrews, it's one of my favorite epistles, um, a lot of the book of Hebrews ends out talking about the Old Testament and how Christ fulfills that. And under the New Covenant, what a lot of those Old Testament types and shadows and forms, what they mean to us today on this side of the cross. So um, let's go ahead and turn into our Bibles for just a quick review. 1 Peter 2, 9. And um, someone else look up 2 Timothy 2, 12. So the two verses, we're go I'm going to have you all read today. 1 Peter 2, 9. Someone else look up 2 Peter 2.12. And then Revelations 1.6. 1 Peter 2.9. Does someone have 1 Peter? Okay, Bob, please. But you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Amen. Thank you, Bob. So the scripture tells us that, but it starts out, but you are not like that. If you read the context, it's talking about those who don't believe, who rejected the chief cornerstone. And it says, but you're not like those that don't believe. You're believers. And more than that, you're chosen. Yeah. You've been called. You've been equipped. You've been thoroughly furnished, the New Testament tells us, unto every good work. And you have an identity in Christ that isn't just a sinner that's saved by grace, like Tom was talking about on Wednesday. It goes beyond that. God says through his son, Jesus Christ, in the New Testament, particularly or often in the Gospel of John, that you are friends. I no yeah. longer call you servants. I call you friends. He calls us brothers. In Ephesians, we're talked about we're joint heirs with Christ. We're not just the scrub. We're not just the servant. We're not just the innkeeper. We have been made brothers and sisters with Christ sons and daughters of the Most High God. We've been made friends with God. Jesus has taken down the wall of separation that separated Jew from Gentile and that separated male from female and rich from poor. Jesus took that all away and now he says, you have a new identity and we know from what Pastor Tom shared a couple weeks ago that Jesus is called our faithful high priest. He's both the lamb that was slain and the high priest. And guess what? Because Jesus is our brother, and because we are joint heirs with him, and everything that he has privilege to or right to, as joint heirs, we do too. The only caveat or difference is this. We know that Jesus walked in full holiness, and we don't always walk in full no, holiness. No, now, we, we should. We endeavor to, but the reality is we don't. But Jesus said, through Paul the Apostle in his epistle to the Galatians, and Tom mentioned it once already, is that God has used the Holy Spirit through Paul to say that if you remain children in your knowledge and wisdom, yes. if we remain children, yes. we're no different than the slave because we don't know what we have, mm -hmm. and we're not of that age of majority where we can then exercise our right to that inheritance because we're under age. Now, the Bible says in faith we're to be childlike. You know, in anger and in malice, we're to be like children. Let it go. You know, have the spat. Let it go. But when it comes to enduring hardship as a good soldier, God's called us to spiritual maturity in the trials of life, yes? Mm -hmm. And he says that in that identity, we're to grow up and we're to be a royal priesthood. We have been made kings and priests unto our God. We've been chosen for that. It says that we were chosen in God, and it says that he prepared good works beforehand. We heard this last Wednesday, that we should walk in them. Mm -hmm. That we should walk in them. That God prepared good works. Now, in the verse that um, Bob just read for us, 
The whole point of being this chosen generation, this royal priesthood, this peculiar people who've been translated out of darkness for light is to do what? Gail. According to this verse, the whole purpose of being called and chosen and identifying as kings and priests, she's looking on her electronic yeah. Bible. <laughs> she's and not we texting. should show forth the praises of, of him. Mm -hmm. So according to the context, there were the unbelievers who reject, scoffed, murmured, and complained and rejected the cornerstone. As a king and a priest, you've been made that so that you would show forth God's praises, that your work, your life, would be a living act of worship. In Romans 12, 1, it talks about that we are to yield ourselves, to offer ourselves up as a living sacrifice. God doesn't make us. He asks us to make an offering of ourselves. And he says that our body should be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of worship. Now, Gail translated your reasonable service, because that's how most English Bibles do. But there's a few translations. And if you look it up in the Greek, it says that it's your reasonable act of worship. Did you get that service? Service where you sacrifice your time, your energy, your body, is considered an offering, a holy offering, because priests, every priest needs to have an offering, yes? Mm -hmm. You're offering your body, your time, your energy, your resources, your giftings as a sacrifice for the sake of others. Now, my good friend here said, God's gifts were not given to us for ourselves, right? Just even as God gave gifts to men of a pastor, a prophet, teachers, evangelists, the fivefold ministry, he gave those gifts to men, not so that those men could revel in their titles. It was so that they could be servants of God ministering to the body of Christ. Likewise, you have the spiritual DNA of your father, and we know that Jesus Christ is called King of Kings, and Lord of Lords. Yep. He's the big K, King. Yep. He is yeah. big L, Lord. Not just Adonai with a small L, because they sometimes refer to even angels as Lord, small L, or earthly kings as yeah. Lords, mm -hmm. small L. He is the King, the only one. Yes. And he is the Lord. And of all of us people, but we have his DNA. And just as Jesus brought himself a living sacrifice, yeah. he said, my life, I came to give as a ransom for many. Yeah. He said, my life, I have the power to lay it down. That's right. And I'm going to. And I have the power to take it up again. Mm -hmm. He said, I came, my mission critical was to destroy the works of the devil. That's First John 3. Mm -hmm. He says, I was made manifest to destroy the works of the devil. He said, I came to be what? A servant. A That's suffering right. servant. Yeah. He said, I came to serve and not be served. So, if we keep those thoughts in mind, when we look at being chosen to be kings and priests, a couple of weeks ago we started to go into what that identity meant. And um, Christopher was mentioning it, a number of people were mentioning it, is that we have a duty as a priest and as a king that we're ambassadors. Mm -hmm. We're not living to ourselves. Mm -hmm. See, here's the thing, a king can make decisions uh, at least in the olden days, maybe not with Queen Elizabeth now, but a king could make decisions and all the subjects of the kingdom had to follow his decree. Right. Yes. All right, you have that kind of power in the heavenly realm. Amen. The Bible says that all authority has been given to us through the name of Jesus, that at the name of Jesus every knee must bow, every tongue confess. They're not bowing at the name of Paula or the, or the force of personality of Paula or Vicky or Noah or David. It's about Jesus. It says the banner that we raise up is the banner of the name of Jesus. He's Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, our banner. But as a king, we are to exercise authority. The authority is not controlling other people. Right. It's putting into subjection our own kingdom, yes. the thoughts, the impulses and inclinations of our flesh to subject them to the obedience of Christ, our thought life, that's a big one, bringing captive. And also, we're to take dominion and authority over our circumstances, right, our trials. And you know what? When you take authority over your trials, and I'm going to say it because I think that um, I think that we've been sold a bill of goods with the faith movement sometimes that says you take authority over your trials, you yell, you shout, you amen, say claim. amen, you claim it, amen. and now everything's better. Boom. No. Amen to you. 
<laughs> yes. And you know what? We don't see that. And I'm not trying to be an anti-faith person. I'm a pro-faith person. But here's the thing. We don't want to deny the reality of this earth's reality. It's that we capture the mind of Christ, which is a higher reality. In other words, if you're coughing up all this stuff, you're sick. No, I'm not. I'm not sick. You're sick. But you know what? You don't have to hold on to that. Let's pray about that. But there's been this holy denial thing that happens with people, and I don't agree with that. I think that what we do is we follow the Bible, and the Bible says all things have been put under subjection to Christ, under his feet. The Bible says that. All things. But the Bible also, in the next verse, says, but we do not yet see all things. We do not yet see with our natural eyes all things under his feet. But as kings and priests, we have a responsibility to say it like Abraham did, to call those things that are not as though they were. So when you take control or authority over your kingdom or over the situation, sometimes you still go through it. I was talking to Jackie. Remember Jackie from our trip? Jackie and Tyler. Jackie was in Wednesday night, and I was prophesying over. I didn't, that was weird. I don't usually do that. But anyway, um, I was talking to Jackie, and I was telling her, Jackie, taking authority doesn't necessarily mean that the next day you wake up and maybe your work situation or your home situation is magically all transformed. You're transformed. That's right. That's yes. right. Because the yes. world, think about it, guys, and I, I saw a hand up. Think about this. You've been conditioned by this culture. I'm not talking about the whole world. Right now I'm talking about the U.S., Western civilization, Babylon kind of culture. You've been conditioned it's not your fault. It's someone else. It was your childhood. Now, you know what? These are all factors. None of us disagree that these are factors that shape us. But you don't get to ride on that when you're 40, 50, 60. You just can't anymore. You can, and it's a choice, or in your 20s. You can, it's your choice, but God says, I didn't call you to be the tail, I called you to be the head. And the head does not mean that just because you're in charge that everything goes your way. No. Think about even King David. Nothing always goes your way. There's no one alive that has everything go their way. Jesus didn't even have everything go his way. His desire was that all should be saved, yes? There's still that human will thing involved. So when you have control, when you're a king, when you're exercising dominion in your setting, in your trial, bless you, uh, in your uh, life, you're taking authority despite what your eyes see. You're hanging on to the verse that says, all things are under my feet, even if I don't see it right now. I lay hold of the truth, the truth, Jesus Christ, who says you're looking at the truth, Pilate. I am truth. He says, Jesus says, you lay hold of me. I'm your reality that keeps you from coming unraveled. It doesn't mean bad stuff doesn't happen. It doesn't mean all of a sudden it's over and everything's happy and jolly. It means that you take control and you don't let that thing, that circumstance, those people, that criticism, that hurt, whipsaw you around and take control of you to where you're the victim. You take authority over it. And you exercise self-control. You exercise love when you feel like lashing out. You exercise humility when you feel like being prideful. Yes, Bob? Uh, there was another hand. I was just told that went up first. Oh, Christopher. Was that you? Oh, I was going to say there's this whole theme in the New Testament of uh, yet but not yet. Yes. You know, it's, like, it's like we see these promises, but we don't quite see them all fulfilled. That is correct. There is a timing. Yep. But at the same it's time, commercial. you know what, Chris? That's an excellent point because I want to bring you to this. Abraham didn't get to see the full realization of all that God had spoken. Mm -hmm. Abraham lived a long time and he finally had his son Isaac after Ishmael, the Ishmael experiment. The Ishmael experiment is when we rush God, we don't like that he's taken so long, and so then we come up with our own patchet job, and that's always a mess. For but sure. Abraham did not get to see the fullness of all his descendants being as the sands of the, of the beach or the shore or the stars of the heavens, but he saw Jesus. And he said prophetically when he was going to offer Isaac up on Mount Moriah, he said, son, 
when Isaac says, hey man, this is weird, it's funky, I got wood on my back, all the accoutrements for the sacrifice are here, but Father, where is the sacrifice? And, and it's just the anointing is coming. And God says, through Abraham, God himself will provide a lamb. So here again, he didn't get to see Jesus Christ in the flesh. But Abraham, through prophecy, he held on to the promises. And it says about him in the Hebrews Hall of Fame in uh, chapter 11 that he spoke those things and called those things that were not, speaking about the deadness of Sarah's womb and his own body being past childbearing years, he called those things that were not as though they were. Bob, you had your hand there. Yeah, yeah, a couple, couple things that I just want to touch base on what was just said. He, it wasn't just Abraham who, who lived for something that they couldn't see. That's right. You know, the lots. prophets, David. Oh, yes. You know, um, they saw through David being very... a prophet. Yes. Um, That's right. But uh, well, just some scripture that just God gives me, you know, scripture every now and then that just jumps out. And, yes. and he says that we're not to live by sight, but by faith. That's alone. right. That's and right. and when, when we see a circumstance that that surrounds us and the difficulty and the trial that we're in. Mm -hmm. We don't live by what we see there, mm -hmm. we live by the faith that we're going to go through it. And all these other pictures came to me about Paul in his journey, yes. all the trials and tribulations he went through. Yes. He wasn't living by sight, well, by what he saw. He's, he was living by what was going to take place. Amen. What was, he was going to get through. That's right, you know? Bob. And who did that too? Jesus. Yeah. He wow. despised the shame of the cross. Those yeah. You're talking about Because he, he, he despised the shame of the cross. You don't rejoice in your suffering, but you rejoice that you know even the stuff that's crummy that happens to us, God has a purpose and a plan. And the reason you can do that is because you're a king. You're not a victim. Mm -hmm. You have the reins of control, not over everybody yeah. else, but over how you're going to respond. Gail, I saw your hand. Well, it's really dubbing on what Bob was saying because <clears throat> in speaking of Paul, you know, when he wrote the letter to the Philippians while he was in a Philippian jail, right? Um, he what he said, I want you to understand that what is everything that's happened to me has only proved to advance the gospel. Yes. And that the word is being heard through all the palace and people are coming to know the word through the through the exactly the horrible things that were happening to Paul. That's so right. God allowed him to stay in that circumstance. He could have let him out just like he did other you know. I yep. mean but he didn't that's you know, right that's at that right. moment. Yeah. You know? And so Paul was saying, Look, my faith is great that I know that whatever is happening to me, my faith is not in the in not in the circumstances Amen. that God's gonna change. That's right. It's in the God. It's in the Amen. one who I call my Lord, my Amen. Savior. And the faith is in the knowing of the person of God that he only <laughs> wants good things for his children. Sometimes it doesn't feel that way. Gail, Sometimes absolutely. we look at our lives and we think, how could this possibly could this be good? Be good. Mm -hmm. You know. That's right. But the faith comes in knowing that God only blesses his people. That's right. You know, do we believe that though? We say it. Do we believe right. that? Because it doesn't it, always feel like how to just so, um, thanks to Christopher, I'm trying to now become more aware of oh. what I share personally here so that it doesn't impact other people because it's on YouTube and so forth. And he does a great job editing, don't get me wrong, but I want to not make his job more difficult. But let me just say that I will not name names. There was a certain situation this week that um, my mother was visiting um, with my sister and they went and had breakfast together and they saw a person, a believer, a family that were believers, okay? And the person was so overcome by their trial. And it's a serious trial. It's not a lightweight trial. It's a big deal. But they had spent so many years in anger and unforgiveness. They were so angry that people didn't do things the way they thought they should be done. They were angry with uh, other brothers and sisters in Christ for not doing what they thought should be done. And now here they are in life, and they're, they're broken down, and they're miserable, and they're depressed, and, and they feel helpless. And, and my mom and sister stopped and told the individual they would be praying, and my mom has been praying. And my mom and I discussed this in the car, and here's the thing. Even from your sick bed, I know she wouldn't mind my sharing. Susan Silos, 
the difference between the situation my mom saw, which were believers, believers, okay, mm -hmm. and Susan Silos, who started out, as most of you know, and she'll say this herself, crusty and crispy. She was pretty rugged. <laughs> and scary. And scary. <laughs> and she was. She just, like my mother, she just got more beautiful with age, yeah. here and here, you know? And she was sitting there with nerve pain and phantom nerve pain because she's an amputee because of complications associated with diabetes. And what I honestly mean this. What I thought was one to two hours of time with her, that's when you know you're having a good time, when time flies. We looked at the clock thinking we better check the meter, and it was four hours later, and we thought it was her clock. And then I had to go check my phone, right? I'm looking at my watch because I have that, but I checked my phone. She was so winsome and sweet. And she admitted the truth about her pain, and we prayed about that. She wasn't in denial about anything. Right. She said, I wow. am blessed. She was thanking God for Amazon, because she gets a lot of things in. <laughs> she had her caretaker, George, there, and was thanking God for him, because he's a believer, and because he's been very helpful. She was finding joy in her pain, yes. literal yes. pain. And I just said, I love you so much. I said, I know you didn't even used to like me. And she goes, oh, I was horrible. She would say that. <laughs> she goes, I don't even know what that was about. But she said, but you know what, Paula? She goes, part of the reason I could support Tom as pastor was because of you. She said, I knew that you wouldn't be married to somebody that was awful or something. And she goes, and Trevor loved him and you loved him. And so I got on board. And then God, she said this. God got a hold of my heart and said, how haughty and arrogant are you that you think that you can de decide who is my anointed? Because Susan was sort of like Tom and I at this church. She has been here many, many years with Trevor in the early days. Ken knows this. And she was saying that God got a hold of her heart and said, let it go. And she said that, she said, honestly, that was the beginning of her change in attitude towards church people, church, mm -hmm. and things like that. And I thought, how beautiful. She, even in her pain, church, was able to take authority because she, even if she wasn't consciously thinking of the verse that she's been made a king and priest unto God, Susan recognized she still has some control as a Christian not controlling people. She can't control all her circumstance, but she can control how she responds. And she can, and I said, you know what? Can I have you pray for us? I prayed for her, we prayed for her. And she prayed for us. And she gets more opportunities to minister to people in that sweetness. And she, and she does. And our church secretary calls her, and she ministers to her, and the secretary ministers to her. It's beautiful. Things that we don't even know of, that that life that a lot of us would go, oh, poor thing, oh my gosh. She's not wanting that. Mm -hmm. She, just like Kathleen Milne, wants to feel like a whole person. She doesn't want our pity. She wants our love, our compassion. Well, God wants us to realize he made us kings and priests. And if the king of kings, Jesus Christ, the Lord of lords, he was scourged, he suffered rejection and name calling, he suffered judgment where people called him a liar, a lunatic, the son of the devil, my goodness, right? He went through all of that, and it says, and he endured all of that, even putting up with the shame of the cross. It says he learned obedience by the things which he suffered, and for this reason he became the captain of our salvation. It says he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Now, I'm not trying to put a big suffer thing on you. I'm going to tell you this, though. I'm going to be honest with you. Life for all of you and I is inherent with human suffering, yours and other people's. I don't need to wish anything or say anything. You already walk that walk. And as Bob pointed out, we're to walk our walk by faith and not by sight. In other words, we don't allow our natural senses as Christian people, we don't walk like the world walks. We're not supposed to be natural. Do we go into our natural carnal nature? Yes, because that's kind of our default mode, unfortunately. But we're supposed to hook in 
to the Holy Spirit. We're supposed to hook up to that Wi-Fi connection. We're supposed to plug into God and access the supernatural because the truth is he that has been born again has been made one spirit with him. You've been made a supernatural being so that no matter what happens to you, whether like to Gail's point, you are imprisoned like Paul. He says, I know God is working something good here. Whether you are going through something in your family, your finances, your job, your church life, your own self-esteem, I want to tell you, you still have a choice. Don't let the devil tell you, well, I was the run to the litter. Oh, I wasn't wanted. I was an orphan. Trevor was an orphan. Tom wasn't wanted. But God wanted both of them and chose them, and he chose you and I. And he chose us, not so that we be these pitiful little people that are just weird, because a lot of people like to, to emphasize the peculiar people aspect. He chose us, as Gail read to us in the second part, that we might show forth the praises of him. You have been brought out of darkness into his light. Another translation says, you've been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the sun, into the kingdom of the son of his love. You have been translated into light. We're to live and walk according to the light. We are no longer living as people that are nocturnal, that are walking around in the futility or darkness as the Gentiles do in their mind. You've had the light of Christ. And what does it say? John's gospel tells us that Jesus is the light. The word, the living word, is the light that lights every man that comes into the world. Amen. We have a choice to extinguish that. Right. We have the choice to put the basket over the light and yes. hide it. Yes. But God says, I would that you were translated as kings and priests to be my representatives, to take authority over some of the evil that you see happening in your own life and the lives of others. And as a priest, you have to offer a sacrifice. And guess what? Just like Jesus, that sacrifice involves your will. It involves your time, your love, your energy, even when it's not returned. And that's the hardest thing for us. It's easy to love, okay, so I'm going to be a total tax collector right now. It's easy to love my friend Gail. It's easy to love Stephanie. It's easy to love Chris. It's easy to love most all of you in here because you are so good and kind and loving back to me. It's another story when somebody has betrayed you, ripped you off, done stuff, isn't it? But God said, yeah, but you're not a beggar at the table of God. You're a king, and you're a priest, and I've made you those things whether you feel it or not, whether you always act like it or not. That's another key that, you know, in the Old Testament, they were selected for a priesthood based on family, right? Christopher, how did they determine the priesthood? What line? What family? What tribe? Levi. That's right. Levi. That's right. High priest, I'm not sure if they had to come from the line of Aaron. I think they did. I think they directly, yes, I think they did because I, I went to, I worked with a fellow who was Co. his last name was Co. but that was an anglicized version of Cohen, and he said Cohens were the priestly class, but that the high priest lineage, they try to directly trace it always back to Aaron back then. So I think you're right, yes? There were other families in the Levite who had different responsibilities for carrying and setting up the uh, right. tabernacle. tabernacle too. Yes, that's right. And they were chosen according to their tribe or their family. Guess what? You have to. Mm -hmm. If you identify with Christ, you're in the family of God. That's all you have to do to qualify to be a priest, is you're in the family of God, you're in the right family. You're yeah. chosen. Right. And he's anointed you. And here's the thing. Sometimes we get ashamed because we don't always act like a priest or a king that we should be. So then we think that disqualifies us, like a big time out, and God consigns us to go in a corner and put our head down. But Jesus Christ said, no. What you did 10 minutes ago, if you ask for forgiveness, he says you could start all over again. And it's not all over like you have to go back to the beginning. Right. Right. He doesn't make you go back. He says, right where you left off, I'm right there. Let's yeah. continue the journey. Yeah. Bob. Well, just, just uh, I was just talking to my wife about when it, years, decades ago when I was, you know, born again and still acting in the carnal nature. Yes. I always told my wife, look, 
A king is king whether he's a bad king or a good king. That's true. That's God, true. Made, Absolutely. God, God made me a king. Don't That's say right. I'm not a king. No, nope, you are. Don't say I'm not a priest, whether That's I'm right. a good priest or a bad priest. That's correct. So, so That's I, correct. I was just talking to her about That's my so past. That's so funny. But, yeah. but yeah, and... and um, That's right. Whether we're yeah. a good one or not. Wow. That's what I've been going on. Yeah. Yeah. And then the testimony yes. about when you guys prayed for me when I was going through the deep depression. Yes. Um, and thinking, you know, death thoughts and all that stuff. Yes. Um, Satan, I two hate weeks you. Ago, yeah, I hate him too. <laughs> two weeks ago, I fell back into that mm -hmm. real quick. Mm -hmm. For two days, I lived that again. Mm -hmm. But then coming down from Bellingham in my truck, all of a sudden, God said, why are you acting this way? And what do you mean? And then I thought, well, I'm a king. I'm a royal priest. You know, I'm, I'm holy and blameless. Yes, I started sure. claiming all these things Amen. that I was. Yep. And realizing who I am. And then all of a sudden, that, that darkness in it, that, that um, the evil that was on me just started clearing away. Mm -hmm. And the light just started coming on me. Mm -hmm. And shining yeah. forth, and, yeah. and I was released. Yeah. See, Bob, you know, so it was said that you should just, show just, forth. Just remembering who we are. That's right. Can bring us out through, through that darkness. Not who the world says you are, not who your family says you are, not even who you say you are. It's who God says Amen. you are. Amen. Yes. He has translated you from darkness into, into the, the kingdom of light, right. acknowledging all those good things that are in you. Yeah. Yes. That's like looking in that mirror. Yes that Pastor Tom's always talking about, yes. that we walk away from and forget what we look Who like. Who we are. And, yeah. But he remembered quicker. That's good. That's hey, good. that's well, that's called that. progress. That's right. All right, next scripture we have 2 Timothy 2.12. Does anyone have that ready for us? 2 Timothy. Oh, Timothy. I thought it was yes, 2 Timothy 2.12. 2 Timothy 2.12. I, I can read it because I have it, but oh, okay, Gail, go ahead. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. All right, you know what, Gail, I'm going to, I'm sorry. Wrong. No, you got the right one. Okay. You got the right one. The key there is about reigning with him. If we die with him, we're going to live with him. If we endure, we will reign. But could you read for us, Gail, that whole section, 11 okay. through 13. Okay, because yeah. I like 13. 11 through 13. If we believe God. <laughs> Yeah, he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. Yeah. Amen. So the whole chunk of scripture there, if we go back to verse 11 in 2 <coughs> Timothy 2, Gail, can you read 11 through 13 all together as one now? Okay. So verses 11, 12, and 13 together. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Mm -hmm. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. Okay, some of you need to write those verses yeah. down. Seriously, you need to memorize that. It says you're going to what? Live with him if you die with him. That's why when Paul talks about uh, that I might know him in the power of his resurrection, we go, woo, hallelujah, and in what? The fellowship of his sufferings being conformable unto his death. The conjunction is not or, it's and. It's and yeah. That there's both. And you know that. For a resurrection to happen, there has to be a death. Now the good news is, God is not calling us to die a martyr's death as far as being nailed to a physical cross. But he is calling something to die. There is a burial. He says we're to be buried with him in baptism. It says, Paul says, I die. <laughs> But it's no longer, but I live, nevertheless I live, but it's not I, but it's what? He lives according to his faith in the Son of God, and that it's no longer I that live, because it says I died in my life, my former life is hid with Christ in God. The blood washes it all away. The only people that are going to remember it are people that are used to the devil to bring it up to yourself, because we can't make your memory erase all that junk, and the devil, who's known as the great prosecutor. Satan, in Jewish belief system, and in Hebrew it means this, it means the great prosecutor. He's the accuser of the brethren. Yes. 
All he's going to do, he's never going to say, good job, Bob. He's always going to say, you suck, and look at that, and how about this, and what about that? And we have to throw back at him what the Bible says. And the Bible says that we should acknowledge every good thing that is in us and in each other in Christ Jesus. I'm never going to feel saved every single day. There's never going to come a spiritual point in my life or yours that you wake up and feel saved. Now, when my body is pain-free on some of it, that, I feel saved. But you know what I'm saying. There's enough in this life thrown at you that feelings... I'm it. I mean, I'll tell you what my song would be. I would be like Eric Carmen. If you're old enough, you know what I'm talking about. All by myself. I don't want to be. Yeah, it's like... That's where our feelings take us. They take us to be lonely, and it's a beautiful song, but you know what I'm saying. It's lonely, despondent, oh, poor me, oh, I'm yearning. And God says, get out, you're not alone. For though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, because Gail's with me, no. Because no. Mama's with me, no. Because no. Vicky's got a lot of faith today, Vicky's with me. No, it says, I will fear no evil because you're with me. That's right. And it's dark, people, but he's translated us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his son. And the verses that Gail read for us says that if we die, if we die what? We also live. That's the good news. The gospel, gospel means good news. Some people carry their Christianity around like bad news. Mm -hmm. Oh, man, stay away from them. We're supposed to be living epistles. The Bible says, read and known of all men. When people see me, it shouldn't be the bad news bearers when they see me. <laughs> what a cloud, it'll never work. We all know people like that. Yeah, or, you know, that I'm, you know, you're out of it, brother, and this, that. People shouldn't have that response. When we walk into the room, some people, like cockroaches, will flee away because they don't like the light, right? They did that right. with Jesus, too. But it shouldn't be that we repel them. You know, now they might flee because of who you are, but you shouldn't repel them. It says that if we die, we shall live. If we suffer, we shall reign. And notice, you're not suffering unto yourself. This is something, you guys, I'm being so honest with you about myself. I had to learn that, and it took a Christian psychologist to get that concept through to me. You keep thinking you're suffering or dying, and it's not the entire truth. That's right. You're suffering with him. That's you're right. going through the valley of the shadow of death, and you're not fearing any evil because he's with you. Amen. And it says that we shall reign with him. It says we are seated with him. He is always with us. Didn't he promise us, I will never leave you nor forsake you, but I will be with you even into the end of the world. But when we go through our darkness, we go through our own personal hell because we isolate and think we're alone. But as Gail read for us, it says, if we suffer with him, we will live with him. Did you get that? Whether you are suffering, Paul said, I've learned a great lesson in life, to abide content no matter what state I find myself. Now, there's people out there all around you all the time, they're in church, out of church, that are haters. If you do well, they're jealous about that. If you do bad, they say you don't have enough faith. If you do just like them, as long as you stay even with them for two seconds and nothing else is different, they might be okay. But don't ever rely on that. God says we're not to compare ourselves amongst ourselves. He says we're unwise when we do that. The benchmark is Jesus, and we Amen. all got a lot of work to do to reach that. Amen. But what we can do, even though we don't see all of that yet, is we identify with him. And we say, Jesus, I blew it. I want to be like you. It takes a real, regal, noble person of character to be able to say, I'm sorry, and I blew it. I can't tell you how this culture is so against that. Yeah. It's about blaming everybody else for your plight in life. Mm -hmm. It's about not taking responsibility but avoiding it. Um, Jesus says, if you want to reign with me, you've got to suffer with me. Mm -hmm. And it's not physical suffering, although there are some people that have some of that going on too. It has to do with the flesh has got to die. Mm -hmm. And we're with him. The beauty part that I didn't get was... Dr. Sarah had said to me, Paula, 
you're such a soft-hearted person and you see these things happening in the world and around and you get so sad and you get so down and she goes but you haven't asked Jesus to come in with you and I go what do you mean you know and she goes Jesus sorrows for those things too like when he wept over the city she goes he wants you to bring him in with that so that he can hold your hand figuratively speaking and remind you that you're going to get through it together and that you can pray and you can have a sense of God's presence that's so precious, so holy, like in the beauty of even dying. Mm -hmm. Like we were talking about, even when people are dying, there's a dignity and a beauty if you know your God. That's right. Yeah. That's All right, Vicki, did I see your hand up? No. Gail, was it you? Yeah, I was going to say this whole concept of dying to self. Mm -hmm. I mean, part of the reason that the Lord wants that is because he knows that that's what we need. Yes. Because we, uh, a lot of that, when we, the more we do that, the more we um, bypass most of what we consider suffering. Yes. You know, most of the suffering that I have in my life is because I think someone hasn't treated me the way I should be treated. You get passed over for a promotion or a project, or your husband didn't mm -hmm. remember this, that, or the mm -hmm. other thing, or someone... Whatever. You yeah. Know? But most of it is because someone didn't know to treat this little person exactly the way she thinks she should deserve to be treated. Yeah. And Jesus is saying, no, that's the part of you, Gail, that I want to kill. Yes. That's the part that needs to go. Yes. When Paul wrote this, yes. these people were truly suffering. Yes. Like none of us will probably ever have to suffer. Right. I mean, the suffering the that he writes about here is. We can't even imagine dying for their faith. Yeah. yeah, and being tortured and being, you know. But yet we also, you know, so a lot of this a lot of the suffering we have in our lives. Now, true, there's people that, you know, we've just lost three people in this church in yes. the last month. Yes. To, you know, yes. cancer or whatever. I yes. mean that was consigned to them. Yes. You know. But and that's true that's true suffering. But yes. most of what we go through in our life, we yes. consign to ourselves. That's right. And that's the, why the Lord wants that to Root it all go. Up. Because that mm -hmm. little part of us that says, look, I'm in charge and I expect everybody else to know it. Nope. And everybody else to treat me a certain way because if they <laughs> oh, don't, boy. if Doesn't they happen. don't, then I'm going to get all <laughs> upset. Right. Right. You know, right. and that's bad for us. So that's why the Lord wants that to die. Yeah, he wants it to die because it's like having gangrene or, or a cancer, God yeah. forbid. He wants to cut that thing out completely. He wants it yeah. to die. Yeah. All right, who has for us, I know it's been a little while, but Revelations 1.6. Let's just reiterate, Bob, go ahead. He has made us a kingdom of priests for God his Father. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Now... Joining the scripture that Gail had read, the batch of scriptures, with what Bob said, is that even when we're faithless, he abides faithful. He cannot deny himself. So even when we don't meet up on our end on the performance, mm -hmm. it says even when we're faithless, when we're lame, he abides faithful. It means any time you can hook up with him again. Mm -hmm. And he's there for us. Now, Bob just read for us that he has made us, these kings and priests, to have dominion yeah. and have to have power in the heavenlies and to take authority over demonic spirits for the Father's sake. You know, we were created for his good pleasure. It brings the Father glory when he sees his children realizing their full potential. Just like all of you, and we talked about it Wednesday night, I think Elise brought up the example of a little one on its bike. When you're training your little son or daughter or grandchild how to ride a bike, the first time, they maybe they got training wheels, and let's say that day comes where the training wheels get taken off so daddy or mommy or grandma or grandpa aunt uncle can you hang on to the back I remember my dad did that for me and I thought I was doing really good but dad was holding on and the day came where daddy let go and as long as I looked forward I was pedaling as if when I looked back I realized he was like bloop because I got distracted and I stopped pedaling and I stopped pedaling and I panicked because daddy wasn't holding on and then the interesting thing was I got to learn to how to do the bike because I realized dad told me get back on again. Right. Now what did not happen in that picture was not God or my father in this situation saying, you stupid idiot, how come you fell off? Or go faster, or you know, let me correct your method of doing that. You know, if you held the handlebars like this, my father didn't do that. 
Your heavenly father doesn't do that with you either. He's not like some of the earthly fathers or authority figures we grew up with that criticized or said it wasn't good enough or let me micromanage and tell you every little detail how you can make it better. God doesn't do any of that. He's rejoicing over you. His banner over you is love. And as a king and a priest, he wants to groom you to be like him. And it's not by reinforcing the negative. Mm -hmm. It's by saying, even when you blow it, I'm just so in love with you. That's God speaking. You know what? You don't feel it today. I'm so in love with you. I wish you could see how in love with you I am. He has made us kings and priests to God be all glory and dominion forever. He made us that because he loves us. Christopher Bobo, could I have you look up for us Romans 5.17? Romans 5, 17. And then, David, may I have you look up for us Ephesians 2, verses 5 through 7. So Romans 5, 17, that'll be Chris, and then David will be reading for us Ephesians 2, verses 5 through 7. I must say that was a really good review. Pardon? That was a really good oh. review. Oh, good. Good, thank you. Go ahead, Chris. In the New Living Translation. All right. For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. For all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So do you see that juxtaposition or that comparison? With what Christopher read to us in Paul's letter to Romans, which happens to be, I think, Gail's mother's favorite epistle, one of Gail's favorites, is that if by one man, Adam, death reigned over us, ruled over us, had control over us, how much more the grace and abundance and power of God that through the one man, Christ Jesus, that we now reign and have control and rule. We're no longer subject to the fear of death or even subject to death in the sense of having to have it rule over us. But it says that we have been called to receive grace and the gift of righteousness so that we can reign in heaven. What's it say? Chris, are we, are we receiving these um, gifts of grace and righteousness so that we can reign in heaven? What is it, Vicki? On this earth. That's right. So that we shall reign in life by one Christ Jesus. God designed it that you and I should reign. And I have heard that in faith circles since the 70s and yep. 80s. Yep. And what they made it look like was reigning was you had the best car, the best house, the prettiest mm -hmm. wife, the cutest husband. Everybody's in health. No one's ever sick. Okay, that's great when you're a young church and you're only in your 20s and 30s. But you live life long enough and you find out that life comes knocking at everyone's door in the form of disappointment, heartbreak, divorce, death, illness. It says that we received grace and an abundance of power through the man Christ Jesus so that we could reign in this life. It means that no matter what life or the devil throws your way, that you come out on top, not because of you, but because of your connection to the one man who did it all, Jesus Christ. That you and I, the problem is, we get disconnected from the vine. We get disconnected from Jesus, and we start taking calls from different operators. The devil, he's like, Judy, the time life operator. Hi. Hi, yeah, for this limited time, I've got a special guarantee. I just want to tell you, you know, you're never really going to amount to anything, and you haven't changed anyway, by the way. And you know you were kind of cranky with your spouse. So, um, yeah, oh, and if you stay on the line a little bit more, I'm going to reaffirm all those things that you're doing at your work. It really doesn't matter. And nobody sees you at church, and you have no friends. Bye! Because we get disconnected. And God is saying, when we are one with him, he's the one. We're the weak link in the chain, right? He's the strong one. He said, we're the bride. We've been made one spirit with him. The problem is we disconnect and we try to do those marriages where they have like uh, open marriage or, you know, they live distinct separate lives. 
God wants us to be so intimately connected with him that when Judy, the time life operator from the devil, calls to tell you about everything you're not and all those things you should have done, you could have done, you waste of time, you waste of space, then you don't take that call. Because your husband says, nobody talks to my wife that way. Jesus says, you're the bride. And I know, guys, don't take it as a woman thing, okay? Take it as you're the beloved. He says, nobody talks to my wife church that way. Nobody talks to my bride that way. You don't get to talk to my bride that way. Those are fighting words. Just like, you know, when they say, your mama, you don't get to talk about my mama like that. You don't get to talk about my bride like that. You don't get to talk about my child like that. You don't get to talk about my child, devil. People, you don't get to call my child names. I've called them a king and a priest. I've called them righteous. I called them anointed and marked and with purpose. I called them a praise in the earth to me. I called them the head and not the tail. I have called them my own friends, my brothers, my beloved children. No one gets to say anything against that. I don't like that. And if they touch the apple of God's eye, Just remind the devil. When he reminds you, they always say this saying, if the devil reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. (laughs) Devil, I don't receive all that. I know I did that. I might have done that five minutes ago. And I'm sorry for that. Uh But that's not who I am. That's right. It's not who I am. My identity is not in what I do. Do you know how many men, Chris, you know this probably at tech industry, I know Gil and I see this, is with my executives, their whole identity is wrapped up in their VP title. They don't know how to operate in life outside of the job. Their whole identity is being this executive that's this wheeler dealer. They don't know, I mean, they have you order flowers for their wife and do something. They just don't. They don't know how to identify as a person, a whole person. Now, I'm not saying that they don't have important jobs, but I'm saying they need to identify as a whole person. God does not identify you by your mistakes any more than you identify your grandchildren or children by the dumb thing or the mistake or the mishap they have. You don't do that. You don't say, hey, stupid. Now, I know. Some of you grew up, I grew up this way too. Some of you grew up where you were called names, like stupid or You'll never amount to much, or you're this, or you're that. But God says, that's all garbage. That's all garbage. He said, I'm a loving father. That song we sing, he's a good, good father. He said, I look at you today, yeah, with your mess, that we all have some mess going on. He says, I look at you in your mess, and I call you a king and a priest. I call you my beloved bride. And someday you're going to be without spot or wrinkle. In the meantime... We have some spots and wrinkles, but I still see you as my beloved, cherished bride, worthy of dying for. I don't like it. I don't like it when anyone says anything nasty about my bride. Mom, you had your hand up? That's right, Paula. Because we are the Christians who do not recognize we are all his children, children of God. Mm-hmm. I cannot really take it on a big deal or anyone because they're his children. That's his child. In other words, our brothers and sisters. That's right. Our, our family. All of us, and yes. We don't recognize that and we're picking on a good or bad, you know, whatever. We're it touching is. God's child. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The reason they're doing that because even I said that there before, but not anymore. Okay, no, 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 no. We have to have an intimacy with the Lord Amen. Jesus. Yes. The meaning of why he kept the cross for yes. us, yes. you know, and why we're pecking on one another. Yes. They still don't understand the meaning of. Right. He did it all for the each of us. us yep. And we are not meditating that area. We only go by the, what? there's a world thing. Yeah. Are you bad to me? So I'm not going to talk to you. Or why are you hurting Good. me? Good word. Yeah, they're not realizing that. They don't we realize it comes family. back. we got to recognize that. Yeah, we mm-hmm. are. Like it or not, we all got that crazy Uncle Larry in our life. <laughs> and sometimes we're the crazy Uncle Larry. Right? Some days we're all crazy Uncle Larry. All right, now, um, David, you have for us Ephesians 2, verses 5 through 7. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy 
made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. Mm -hmm. It is by grace you have been saved. Amen. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Thank you, David. What a beautiful segment of scriptures. Again, it's talking about how great God's love is, that even when we were dead in our sins, that he brought us into new life. He quickened us. He resurrected us. He made us alive when we were in sin. Not when we cleaned ourselves up and looked all pretty. When we were a hot mess, even then, it says that he quickened us, brought us into resurrection life together with Christ, and that he's raised us up and made us to sit together in heavenly places. And what I love is at the last verse that David read, verse 7, it says not only are we uh, going to show forth in the ages to come the surpassing riches of his grace, but his kindness toward us. Yeah. God is a good father. Some of us are living like our Christianity is something we have to endure. And I've got to tell you, some days I've done that. Some weeks you've done that. Some weeks yeah, I've done that. Done but it. we need to stop with That's that. Right. Amen. You know, sometimes we're so numb to the reality because exactly. we buy this world exactly. system as our reality. Yeah. And it's not the final word. Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. He has the final word. We keep looking at the world like it dictates who we are. The circumstances tell me whether I'm happy. Hey, if I look at the circumstances and I think I'm fair and say, if you look at the circumstances, we all have a lot to be depressed about. And there's some good things peppered in there, but there's a lot to not be happy about. Well, you know what? When I look at my Savior and realize how kind, how loving, how giving he is, that even yeah. the stuff that really doesn't feel good, that he's using all of that to work together for our good. When I realize how kind he is, that that, okay, I'm going to just say it like, let's say you were thinking, you know, that stupid job that I have to go to with all those people. Now, I don't say that, but let's just, we'll pretend. I don't actually say that. But a stupid job that I have to go to with all those people, you know what? The change is in your mind yes. and your perspective. Yes. When you've been made alive to righteousness, it's not church that I have to get up and go to. It's not work I have to get up and go to, or I have to be nice to sister so-and-so or brother. No, it's that you get to. Yes. Because yes. you were shown such great abundance of grace and kindness yes. that you, having that same DNA, spiritually speaking, in you and I, if we choose to activate it, we can give that forth and make the world a better place. Now, sometimes we're too numb in our sin, in our self-righteousness, in our bitterness, in our routines, that we need a jolt. So I give you a real quick, uh, in closing, I give you one little testimonial. Most of you, I think most of you in this room, well, maybe a couple of you didn't hear it. But anyway, this past Wednesday morning, let me start Tuesday night. Tuesday night, I went to my final physical therapy appointment. I don't talk a lot about it, guys, but I have this thing called spondylolisthesis. I know, it took me like two months to learn how to pronounce that. Anyway, I have an, a spine where part of the vertebrae are slipping off. Okay. And um, sometimes you go asymptomatic with it. Some people are born that way. Some people, it's from injury, accidents, and stuff. But what it can, now long and short of it, do is it throws you out of alignment and it's not curable by doctors, and it can cause sciatica and extreme pain and debilitation in your movement, and some people have to get surgery. Okay. All right, so I went to physical therapy. I did two rounds of it, meaning two cycles of it. And I finished my last one Tuesday night, and I was grateful, and they gave me a little certificate. <laughs> and I was like, thank you, God, I'm done. I'm gonna, they told me, your pain, doesn't necessarily go away. Now, God, it does. I'm getting a lot of prayer there. But you know how to manage it. And I thought, I'm going to say it. Damn straight I do. Because it takes prayer. It takes exercise. It takes applying a cold pack sometimes. Sometimes it means you back off of exercise. Sometimes it means you do more exercise because you need to stretch it out, okay? So I'm learning all that. Okay. Wednesday morning, I go for my run at Green Lake. I'm feeling good. My second lap around, 
I send my girlfriend who goes with me. I never run alone because that's not wise. It's daylight now. It's 6 in the morning. And I sent her to go ahead. We we're almost done with the second lap. And I wanted her to have the advantage of a few minutes to go feed her dog before she had clients arriving at her, at her studio. Well, at 6.03 or something, I'm running. There's another lady, a different lady that's ahead of me, maybe to where um, Mama Noel is, about that far. She's ahead of me. Um, and we both hear this screeching, squealing, horrific sound, and we both look towards Highway 99 Aurora. And it's that piece of Aurora that kind of runs parallel with Green Lake. And we see this black coupe vehicle flying down on, over the embankment, down onto the path, the asphalt walking path, and between us. Oh my goodness. Now, thank God the angels kept. Yeah. She was so shocked, she said she almost peed her pants, this girl. She came running up to me and she was crying and in hysterics and we just held each other. Some people witnessed it, some elderly folks walking their dog that were coming the opposite direction. The guy got sighted, I don't know for what yet. They wouldn't tell me, on, the sergeant didn't tell me. But I'll tell you what, I went to work. <laughs> of course you did. I went to work. I got in my car. I let some tears come out because that was rather shocking. I almost died. The guy did not stop on the pathway, you guys, in his car. He was squealing his tires, burning rubber, because he was trying to escape the scene of the incident. To go back, where was he facing? Me, because I'm on the hillside. She's by the lake. She had sprung back to the lake to not get hit. And I'd sprung up on the hillside. I was trying to, by this little tree, and I was like, stop. I said, Jesus Christ. I go, Jesus. And then I go, stop to him. And I am convinced that the angels flatted his tires out. <laughs> his front tire was flat, and I think he probably bent his rim from the, and so he couldn't go, he was trapped. So he just gets out of his car and gets on his cell phone to call his buddy to come get him. No, I'm sorry, nothing. And so anyway, the police are looking into if it was a stolen car, and that's all they could tell me. So no wonder he was in a hurry, right? So yeah, that scared the bejeebers out of me. Now the girl said it almost made her Potty, right? <laughs> and I sat there and I, I got to work and I was a little bit weird because I had to get back on my freeway, go down I-5, get on to I-90, and then get into work and I'm kind of like, okay, I, th I, th I think I need some tea, not coffee. Right? <laughs> yeah. So I say all this to say this, I feel more alive than ever. Mm -hmm. Because I'll tell you why. It wakes you up literally that That's I right. could be not here. Uh -huh. And that'd be okay, I'd be with Jesus. But because I am here, it reminded me we all have purpose. And we all affect each other. And I could sit there and go, oh, I can't do anything wrong. And that would be okay. It would be acceptable. You guys would say, you just went through a trauma. But instead, God said, use that to empower you. Do you get that? The thing that was going to take my life, because of somebody else's record, God didn't say it was time up. He has the final say so. I didn't get to graduate. I got to be here still. That means I got work to do. You got work to do. Every day we get to go to work. Every day we get to come to church. Every day we get to love our aging parents. We get to love our kids. We get to love our grandkids. Every day his mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O God. He is faithful or faithless. Now I say that because... Saturday, I woke up and I felt excruciating pain in my back. I could barely move. I was in so much pain. My mom doesn't know. She's hearing it for the first time. I had tears coming out of my eyes. And I felt like a cripple. I couldn't even get out of my bed. And I thought, oh, Lord, I thought maybe that jump from that guy maybe healed me. <laughs> and I began to pray. And I said, damn it, devil, lay off, you yeah, know? Right. And I began to pray. And I went and I, I, I dragged myself off onto the floor. And I laid on the floor and I did the stretching exercises. I tried, it hurt, I tried. And then Tom came out of the bathroom and he saw me on the floor and he's like, what's going on? He prayed over me. No pain? Praise the Lord. And immobilized, excruciating, I don't cry over pain, I suck it in. And I'm like tearing up going, God. And he said, that is my love kiss to you, to remind you, keep fighting. And that's my testimony to you guys. It's okay to cry. It's okay to get upset, but get up. Get back up. Don't let the devil tell you who you are. Right. Don't let him enfeeble you in any way. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.
Because you just, just made a king of Yes, Victoria, and I'm all done. Just one little thing. For um, today. I mean, real quick thing. Um, yes. That alive, that, that feeling of being alive. Yes. The incident. Yes. Comes back to choices. Yes. Yes. Because you made the choice. Yes. I have a choice that I can yes. do what I need to do to survive this day the way God wants me That's to. That's right. And there are plenty of other times, I'll be honest with you, where I just gave it up and gave it to the devil in my flesh and said, oh, poor me. Oh, this are makes me upset. I'm really unhappy. And then I can't, but then so you can't stand problem. yourself even. And you get sick of being with yourself. So yeah, the devil knows that too. So God's given us choice. Choice yeah. to exercise dominion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Choice that even when circumstances we yet not see all things under his feet, we can still take authority and still see God's love and victory. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you. 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 are you making a special announcement? No, I oh. just wanted to hear your last part. Oh, okay. Okay. That much. Oh, <laughs> Jr., could you could you close us in prayer, Jr.? Father God, we thank you, Lord, for Paula, Lord, and her heart for you, thank and you. her heart, Lord, for sharing your word. Yes. Yes. We just ask you, Lord, that what she has spoken, Lord God, would uh -huh. penetrate our hearts, yes. Lord God, and that uh, we would meditate on it uh -huh. the rest of this uh, yes, next Lord. week, Lord God, yeah. that we apply it to our lives, Lord God, and that our eyes be open. Uh, not only uh, uh, who you are, but who we are in yes. you. Oh, amen. We thank you, Lord, for that. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 amen.